Uh, the presentation this morning is entitled Healthcare Strategies for Long-Term Care. But it is really a case study. It's a case study about a man who was disabled in an automobile accident. He was injured and then he chose to die. He was a C5 quadriplegic or tetraplegic, depending upon which term you prefer. He was quite intelligent. He had significant computer skills. He'd been an administrator at a university. He could have readily been re-employed. He faced a chronic but not a terminal disorder. And that's the key word for Mr. Sims, disorder. It is the best description of what took place in his life. His life was severely disordered even though he was nowhere near death. Well, I've been involved in rehabilitation and long-term care for years and worked with a lot of people who are dying and many more who are moderately or seriously disabled. The case of Mr. Sims, which is a, took place about a year and a half ago, served for me uh, as a, a mechanism to bring into focus, a lens to bring into focus the many institutional needs that are in long-term care as well as the cultural values that work against positive change to address those needs. In that light, what I want to ultimately suggest in this presentation is that Christians should work to develop as many practical, structural, institutional solutions as possible while recognizing that the social forces are not operating in our favor. Nor, I'm willing to argue, are they operating in the favor of people with disabilities who see very few choices in their future. Allow me to provide a little bit of a personal background, if I may. My paternal grandfather always limped. Um, well, not always. He limped as long as I knew him, which was, indeed was not his entire life. Uh, he was severely wounded in one of the first uh, up and overs from the trenches in the Argonne Forest. He caught shrapnel in the hip, and his right leg was three inches shorter than his left leg. About a decade after my grandfather died, which was 15 years ago, so my grandmother about five, seven years ago, was institutionalized in a nursing home due to severe arthritis and to a chronic immunological problem that made her extraordinarily susceptible to infection. Now, um, I wonder, in retrospect, whether or not we should have put her in a nursing home, given the problem with infection. But at the time, it made sense, and it made sense to my grandmother, too. My mother is a severe diabetic with neuropathy. She goes through dialysis four times a day at home, which means that she cannot travel any place that's more than an hour away so that she can get back. And it also means, because of neuropathy, that she really can't get around in the house very well either. My introduction to, <clears throat> to brain injury and to spinal cord injury occurred when my father fell off a ladder while he was painting our house. And I was able to give him the first aid. He not only broke his back, but he sustained a TBI, a traumatic brain injury. While he's pretty much recovered from that, um, it, honest to goodness, took years. It took years. And he is still extraordinarily crabby when the weather changes. Now, if, if you've ever been around somebody with a spinal cord injury who still is feeling pain, um, I mean crabby when I'm saying crabby. I mean that he has to literally leave the room in order to uh, not create a scene. Well, there was Mrs. Swimmer down the street, and there was my great aunt, and there were numerous other people whose lives had been somehow woven into my life who have lived or live with some disabling condition. Disability, in one form or another, has been an integral part of my life, from carrying my grandmother up the stairs, to waiting for my father to get through about a pain, to bathing my mother's infected feet. It's been part of my life, and I am willing to argue. I am willing to argue that I am not the exception that many, many people are either disabled or live with somebody who is disabled. The other night, I believe it was Nigel Cameron, who noted that very few modern people have actually witnessed death. That's true. But many, many people have seen or interacted with in some way somebody who is moderately or seriously disabled. You just can't miss it if you're looking. 
It's estimated that there are 43 million Americans who are disabled, mildly, moderately, or seriously. That's about one out of six. Now, I'm bringing all of this up because the people who are being persuaded that they cannot live with a chronic disabling condition are people that you know. They're not distant case studies. They're people that you know and care about. All 43 million people do not need long-term care, but many of them do, many more will, and at least some of them will kill themselves or will be killed in part because sufficient care opportunities do not exist or they are perceived to not exist. Basically, there are five analytical categories of seriously disabled persons. If you look on the pass out, I think you'll see it. Five categories are right here. The near term dying. Those are people who are treated by hospice. They are far more frequently in nursing homes, in hospitals, occasionally home health. Second category, the long term dying. Again, these are people who are treated hopefully by hospice. They're in nursing homes, home health, sometimes hospitalization. A third category, the disabled who are not dying, but whose lives are radically altered, though they are not cognitively or affectively impaired. Again, these people are in nursing homes or served through home health. Maybe they have some kind of independent living support, perhaps parish nursing if they're fortunate. Rarely will they be in transitional facilities, rarely will they have used transitional facilities, and rarely will they be in residential facilities. Fourth category, the disabled whose lives are radically altered and are cognitively or effectively impaired. Again, nursing homes, home health, maybe parish nursing, transitional facilities and residential facilities. And a fifth category, are those persons who are in ongoing comas or persistent vegetative states. These people are in hospitals, nursing homes, sometimes home health, and a very, very few of them are in coma stimulation programs. Now, as I discuss the long-term care options this morning, please recognize that I am restricting my consideration to categories three and four. I'm not talking about persons with recognizably terminal conditions. They are best treated by hospice. I will not discuss those very, very few cases in which someone is in a persistent vegetative state or near PVA. These people really represent an extraordinarily small minority of people who are chronically ill. The far greater problem is what happens to those who are severely disabled and aware of it, at least to some extent who will live for years. I refer principally to people like Larry McAfee, Elizabeth Bouvier, and perhaps Michael Martin, to reference a few of the familiar cases. These are people whose lives are full of difficulties. And let's not even suggest, let's not even pretend that all they need is a stiff upper lip or just a gentle word of encouragement. That would be ridiculous. You know, that's sending somebody away, uh, telling them, go and be of good cheer, but uh, I'm not going to feed you. Their families and the patients themselves have radically altered their lives or had them radically altered for them. These persons now face countless handicapping obstacles. Does that necessitate a meaningless, purposeless life? No, it does not. Yet, that is what some people will argue, and it is unquestionably what Mr. Sims, the C5 quadriplegic, believed. There is one universal claim of the secularized, pluralistic, privatized society uh, described by Ravi Zacharias the other night, and that is individual autonomy. People really do believe that that is the one thing that they hold in common with all others. Mr. Sims seemed to be convinced existentially at a, at a gut level that no one really lived with a severe disability because somehow they had lost that autonomy and therefore had a meaningless existence. In fact, and I was trying to count them up. I'm sure that I've dealt with hundreds of people who have died and, and literally thousands and thousands of people with serious disabilities. He is probably the only person 
that I can remember who was truly hopeless. I do not mean depressed. This man was not depressed in that sense. Depression is a frequent thing among persons with recent disabling injuries, including suicidal depression. That's not what this was. With the agreement of his family, Mr. Sims had concluded that life with a serious disability was utterly pointless. It was alienation with no sense of anger. It was anomie with no sense of desperation. Now, certainly, I, I have met my share of people depressed by a new injury or emotionally worn out by a chronic condition or mentally exhausted by a severely impaired son or daughter or wife or husband. But Mr. Sims was not simply depressed. Neither the psychiatrist thought that nor the psychologists. Rather, Mr. Sims, and apparently his entire family, had truly accepted an argument suggested in philosophical forums and political arenas. He and his family believed that he had virtually ceased to exist. Mr. Sims, as Mr. Sims, was nearly gone. His autonomous self was all but lost. His identity was obliterated. If Mr. Sims could not live autonomously, he would die autonomously. So, since he did not have to accept the care, or the beneficence, if you like those four little parts of the chant, uh, from the rehab institution, and since the institution did not choose to participate in his intentional demise, Mr. Sims left, discharged AMA. He died without the assistance of any hospital or home health agency personnel. He went to a sibling's home. The sibling, at his continued insistence, pulled his peg tube, and he died weak from poor nutrition of an infection that he had stopped taking medicine for. It took about two weeks, or that's at least what we're told. The kind of thinking that's demonstrated by Mr. Sims is not shared by the vast majority of persons with disabilities, with serious disabilities. But, since we're here to talk about healthcare strategies, I think that we should note that there is some evidence to suggest that Mr. Sims' view, or an approximation of it, is apparently held by a lot of providers. Paris, in a 1993 article, determined that medical students and health professionals viewed the quality of life for the disabled in a far more negative way than did the disabled themselves. According to Gerhardt et al., while 98% of non-disabled emergency room providers and 95% of quadriplegic SCI survivors thought that they were persons of worth, only 55% of those same ER providers declared that they would be persons of worth if they were to sustain a disabling spinal cord injury. In other words, there was a difference of a phenomenal 40% with those who were actually disabled with spinal cord injury. The same discrepancies exist when asked about having a positive attitude toward life and feelings of failure. Gerhardt and Corbett, 1995, go so far as to suggest that these health professionals may well bias the decision-making of or for vulnerable persons. Consider, if you will, how this attitude, once shaped by many insurers, or excuse me, shared by many insurers and managed care administrators as well, is structurally manifest in long-term care. If you look at this, going across the x-axis at the top, you'll see need discernment, acute care, subacute care, and post-acute care. Then down the y-axis, you'll see medical center, outpatient center of some sort, residential, and home-based. By residential, I mean residential, but not the home. And if you use the matrix, you can uh, determine who's where and what the relationships are. I'm presenting this to you because this is basically the flow of persons who are entering into some kind of long-term care treatment. What is important to note is that the attitude, the attitude of the insurers and the, probably the employers who decide who gets what kind of insurance and the medical professionals is such that payment is not restricted to but is strongly lumped up here. If you go into an ER or you need acute care, the payer sources are probably going to pay. 
The payer sources, however, well, excuse me, the payer sources will also pay some for nursing home, at least to a degree, and less, but they're improving in home health. What they don't pay as much for is rehabilitation care, and they pay virtually nothing for transitional living, um, depending on the insurer hospice, respite care, and home support. So the general approach, in other words, to a disabling injury or illness within the healthcare system is, as John Kilner suggested the other day, high care or no care. Let me reiterate, there's reimbursement for high tech. There is some for nursing homes and home health, far less reliable coverage for rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, by the way, is what you go to if you have severe arthritis, if you have a stroke, spinal injury, brain injury, etc. cetera. Uh, and there's hardly any coverage at all for transitional living, residential care, or respite care. So the system functions the way it does because money validates the prevailing personal attitudes of health care providers and insurers and policy makers. This view may change a little bit as managed care increases, but I'm willing to guess it will not change for the better. The groups of decision makers seem to be disproportionately made up of people who believe in autonomy. And they believe in personal success as proof of one's moral worth. So with that as a, as a cultural and institutional background, let's consider what the options are for the future. With the understanding that there could be radical changes in healthcare delivery um, over the next few years that will create a greater or lesser burden on Christian institutions and providers. And as we're doing this, please keep Mr. Sims in mind. Because the question of strategies is transformed when you realize that the person against whom you may sometimes have to act or, or with whom you may sometimes have to argue is the very person you would like to help. It is a fine line between care and paternalism. And it's a line made even thinner by the activities of Dr. Kevorkian and other practitioners who promote autonomy as the ultimate value. Well, I'm proposing seven specific institutional intentions. I'm not calling them strategies because I believe specific strategies really depend upon the particular community environment. There is, in other words, a certain moral allometry that is required, a need to respond with different types and sizes of organizations to the different types and sizes of problems. Well, the seven intentions, which are listed, are improve staff education. And this really should be twofold. S staff members really need to have an improved understanding of disability as a cultural and social event. And the other part of it is there needs to be moral education of staff members. The second intention I list is uh, some beginning to patient moral education. I mean teaching patients morality. The third stage, or the third intention, excuse me, is to begin educating managed care case managers and insurers about the need for improved funding for rehab and for post-acute care. Fourth, develop transitional living facilities. Five, develop residential facilities. Six, develop in-home transitional living support, sometimes called independent living. And seven, develop respite care. Intention one, staff education. The ER workers who were surveyed are certainly better informed about certain aspects of health care than the general public but they do not understand long-term care. They are instead practicing on the basis of the societal bias against the disabled. Gerhardt and Corbett put it this way. In the days and weeks following a severely disabling injury, individuals may die for the wrong reasons. They may die because of what they do not know rather than what they do know. That this happens on an individual level is concerning and at least in some cases speak, seems to speak of the failure or inadequacy of informed consent. However, much more alarming are the pervasive societal ramifications. Each time a newly spinal cord injured person chooses death over life and is allowed to die, society is shown proof that it's better to be dead than disabled. 
Now, of course, there are many caring people working in ERs and working in long-term care. But these people are not impervious to the devaluing of disabled persons prevalent in our society. So the starting point for long-term care strategies must be educating providers about disability and hopefully changing attitudes toward the disabled. Attitudes that simply are not based on an accurate portrayal of life with a moderate to serious disability. One good tool for this, I should have put it on your, in your sheet. I, I apologize for not having done so. A good tool comes from the World Health Organization, and it's called the ICIDH, the International Classification of Impairments, Disabilities, and Handicaps. Now, the specifics of their model are extremely awkward, imprecise, and really not especially useful. But the overall model is very, very useful and very, very helpful in teaching practitioners. An impairment is an anatomical or physiological disorder. For instance, a C5 spinal cord lesion. A disability is a functional problem that arises from the impairment. For instance, a mobility limitation due to quadriplegia associated with a C5 injury. Handicaps are the limits created by social, psychological, and cultural barriers. For instance, the seven centimeter concrete lip that keeps the C5 quadriplegic in the electric wheelchair from getting into the church. That would be a handicapping barrier. Now these distinctions help patients, help family members, but they especially help providers because it allows them to recognize what can be changed and what can't be changed. So it increases the possibility that there'll be realistic expectations that then can be acted on. Now, certainly, it'd be wonderful if an impairment could be cured and the person could get up and walk, but if he or she learns how to effectively use a chair, a wheelchair, then mobility is regained, even if limb movement is not, and functionality overcomes the disability. If he or she was unable to get into the church building because of the barrier at the door and the barrier is removed, then access has overcome a handicapping barrier. Along with educating the staff along this line uh, in the analysis of chronic disorder, they may need some moral training. We had an interesting incident occur. The uh, chaplain at our hospital, um, I supervise the chaplain, and he is a C5 quadriplegic. Uh, he drives. And uh, drives well enough that whenever I go with him, I fall asleep. So, I mean, you know, it's, you know, no problems. He uses a joystick. But he has to have a special parking place. One of our employees parked in his parking place. Now, this parking place not only has his name on it, it has a gigantic square painted with the universal uh, handicap sign. And it's got a handicap sign in front of the space. Uh, I'm usually a gentle soul. But I have to tell you, my response when the personnel director asked my opinion was, fire her. Don't warn her, fire her. We can't afford to have somebody who thinks like that, who has that kind of moral orientation working in our hospital. He gave her a warning. But, but, he did change the personnel requirements so that the next time it happens, any disabled space, our employee, if parking there is not disabled, will be terminated. That's it. Because there has to be an orientation, an attitude. I'll go so far as to say um, a virtuosity among persons who are working in long-term care. They have to have the appropriate approach, maybe even a desire to be advocates for people who have disabilities or some kind of handicapping condition. Well, intention two, values education for patients and families. Gee, this is controversial. Controversial, you mean that uh, I want people to, uh, who come into the rehab center to be taught certain moral positions? That's exactly right. That's exactly what I want to have happen. Mr. Sims was entitled to believe what he wanted, so was his family. But a long-term care facility also is entitled to have foundational values which guide daily practice. If long-term care is to make any real sense, and I would also add if it's to obtain any funding, uh, 
it is necessary for such institutions to realize that they cannot be, nor should they be, value neutral. As if value neutrality existed anyway. But they shouldn't pretend to be. Rehab and transitional living and other forms of long-term care exist because of a very specific moral assertion. People with chronic conditions still count. They're not refuse to be discarded by the society. They're not shameful aberrations to be hidden away or even worse, eliminated. They do not need to be ashamed of themselves. I don't know whether Mr. Sims was or not. This valuing must be taught to injury survivors, to persons with chronic diseases, to their family members who, as I mentioned, are also affected by the disorders. Life can be restored. It's a notion that's quite compatible with the Christian theme of redemption, but not exclusively so. Long-term care facilities must be willing to have moral teachers. They must be willing to stand for something. Mr. Sims personified the movement in the United States that would devalue any human life that's not independent, as if any life is independent in the first place. He apparently believed that disabled life was not human life, or to be more accurate, and I find this just as ironic as, as can be, he believed in both American myths, both, both the American myths of autonomous individualism and moral relativism. So one time when he was expressing what he wanted done, he said that disabled life was not human life for him. It was an interesting effort to put together those two uh, parts of the American mythology. His family, including his wife, who divorced him while he was hospitalized, agreed, by the way. So did the people paying the bills, because it saved them money for no other reason. Um, and that, let me mention that parenthetically. Long-term care costs more than killing people. So, so don't look for economic solutions. Don't think that the, the market, unless there are other pressures, is going to resolve this favorably. It's cheaper for people to die. In any event, the attitude that they had has to be transformed whenever possible. Intention three, insurer and case management education. These folks have got to learn about a continuity of care, that it doesn't end when somebody's discharged from an acute care facility. As an example of the ignorance, and this is really a, a great, great story, the ignorance or wanton ignoring of need on the parts of some employers and insurers, the CEO of one of the very large hospitals in Jackson, Jackson, contrary to all the malicious and cruel things you think about Mississippi, Jackson uh, is an outstanding medical center. In fact, healthcare is the second largest employment sector after government in Jackson. In any event, one of the CEOs of one of the hospitals came to our institution asking us to assume charity care for an injured employee of his hospital because it turns out that their health plan didn't have any kind of long-term coverage. There's an education problem. As long as the society generally and the health care decision makers specifically, especially the employers, because they're the ones who select the plans, as long as they continue to view disability as one, a curse worse than death, and two, as a rarity, which it is not, then the structures of long-term care will change only very slowly, if at all. And a lack of continuity due to a lack of funding is going to push people to view chronic disability as an unresolved crisis. The option they're going to see is either a, a return to normal life or death. Anything else will be seen as a medical purgatory. That's the dichotomy that Mr. Sims accepted, and his payer sources endorsed it, by not allowing transitional living or significant home support. Instead, they told him that he could go to a VA nursing facility that was several hundred miles away. He rejected the offer. The only way around this funding problem is to bring the insurers, and especially the employers, into the education loop. Fourth intention, transitional living facilities. There just aren't very many of them, and I'm not going to go into a lot of specifics about them, but there needs to be a place when somebody leaves acute rehabilitation where they can go and stay for months while they learn skills of daily living, while they learn how to uh, re-enter the society at large, maybe as they reconstruct their profession, or they reconstruct certain social skills that might have been lost if they're a brain injury survivor. 
There are a few facilities around. Most of them are for profit. Most of them are not covered by insurance. Christian organizations, and by this I mean large churches or annual conferences or, or any other kind of church organization, ought to consider developing these kinds of facilities. I mean, why not? It's not impossible. We're not a transitional living facility, but I'm going to use us as an example. Twenty years ago, a group of Christian laypersons got together and decided we really needed a high-quality rehab hospital attached to the University Medical Center in Jackson. So they got together the funding, and 20 years later, we're a 124-bed rehabilitation hospital, which is pretty big for a rehab hospital. We have a skilled nursing facility. We have extensive orthotics prosthetics. We draw persons from three-state uh, service area. We have a surgery suite for decubiti repair and spinal injury stabilization. We have a home health agency. All of that was done by church people. It can be done. Transitional living facilities aren't nearly as complex as rehab facilities. Now, in all honesty, it will mean that, uh, that people will have to interact with the government, maybe obtain some waivers. It may mean that people have to look for some kinds of insurance protection, but it can be done. As we learn from abortion, if we're going to take a stand, we ought to put our money where our mouths are. Residential facilities, intention five, very similar to transitional living, but they're permanent. People live in them. And using a similar kind of reasoning, Christian organizations should help develop permanent residences. Now, there are facilities for people with developmental disabilities that are available but there are not very many at all for people who have acquired chronic disorders. Ideally, these will be places that include work and education opportunities. They could be located in rural settings so that people could garden or participate in recreational activities. Or they could be in small towns or urban areas so that residents could interact with neighbors and could have access to community resources and transportation. The facilities may have to have some specificity. It may be that a facility would be oriented toward TBI, toward traumatic brain injury, or toward mobility impairment problems, or toward CP. Intention six, transitional living support. This is different than an actual facility. People need help to, to make the transition once they go back to their homes. Parish nursing is one great way to accomplish some of that. But it's not all that's needed. There's no reason that the government-supported programs of independent living, which sometimes end up being too bureaucratic anyway, that those shouldn't be supplemented. Parish nursing can help, but other people from the churches can help. They can teach people how to handle bills, especially the incredible bills that come from providers and insurers. They can teach people how to interact with vocational rehab or with other state rehabilitation programs. They can help develop home employment opportunities for people. It's an area ripe for church participation. Especially useful would be help from lawyers, small business owners, accountants, and social workers. One additional way of helping people make that transition back into their own communities, too, that I do want to mention has to do with accessible housing. At this very moment, I mean, literally, it's uh, 1123 uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, just like it is in Chicago, at this very moment, our hospital is uh, having a work day at their Habitat for Humanity house. And the house is an accessible house. There's no reason that churches can't go that far. Start building something because the impairment isn't going to go away. But the disability can be overcome through functionality and through the elimination of handicapping barriers. Why not help build these houses? Well, the final intention is respite care. <laughs> My personal favorite, because I'm not physically disabled, but I've had a lot of family members who are. Often forgot in the period of acute hospitalization as a family. Um, as a family member, I want to assure you that that disabling event is just as real, though in a much different way. But it's just as real for the family members. And it is just as disconcerting, disordering for them frequently as it is for the person who has actually been injured or become seriously ill. The best thing 
the best thing, the strongest correlation for, um, of recovery for persons with chronic illness after faith, as far as I'm concerned, faith in God, is a supportive family. And yet, without respite care, the family can be overwhelmed to the point of destruction. I like to think of respite care as a sort of health care Sabbath. I think it's a real biblical idea. And once again, it's a place where the churches can rise to the occasion and serve. Churches can assist in the house. It may be also that some kind of institutional form would be possible if a church went and developed a transitional living facility or some kind of residential facility. Well, there are seven good intentions, and we all know what's paved with good intentions. Uh, in this case, it's the road to death for the disabled, as well as the road to hell for, you know, maybe for us, if we do nothing to serve this segment of our society that is so disenfranchised. Jesus did command us in a rather vivid image, I remind you, the parable of the sheep and the goats, to visit and take care of the sick. Far too often, decisions for death are made because no potential is seen for the future, no real active concern is seen on the horizon. That's due to a lack of continuity of care especially the transition back to the community and due to a lack of respite care for family members once they are, once the injured person is back in the community. Long-term care has been misshaped by attitudes about disability and it has been reinforced by funding sources. It's time that a continuum of care that demonstrates a recognition of the intrinsic worth of disabled persons as community members is seriously promoted. You know, the automatic response of Christians looking at euthanasia is to assume that some policy change or some new law or some court ruling will solve the problem. I'm in favor of those things happening, but folks, it isn't going to solve the problem. The baby boom cohort is aging. People now survive violence and motor vehicle accidents at phenomenally high rates thanks to EMTs and ERs. Technology and good nutrition and medications are increasing the length of life for the elderly. Chronic severe disability is a problem that will not go away with a change in the law. As we learn from abortion, protest must be matched by real enacted concern. A woman who sees no alternatives will still get an abortion. A person who is chronically, seriously disabled, who sees no alternative, will seriously consider killing him or herself or will be put in a situation where somebody else does it for him or her. Alternatives need to be provided so the choice is not between a VA nursing home 200 miles away or death. And that was the choice Mr. Sims had. You know, I don't believe if other institutional alternatives had existed for Mr. Sims or his family that they really would have acted any differently. But I do think that others would have and others will. I certainly hope that the policy changes do occur, changes that protect the disabled from suicide doctors, but it will be a hollow victory unless we help these persons help themselves by providing alternatives to being shut up in nursing homes or being killed. The choice Mr. Sims made will appear over and over again in our increasingly disconnected society unless clear and obvious and available institutional alternatives exist. Many in Mr. Sims' situation sense that they have no desirable alternatives to death. And in a society that puts a premium on autonomy as self-sufficiency, illusion though it may be, the choice that they make when they choose death is quite rational. It is horrendously immoral, but it is quite rational unless we provide them some other choice.